So, good evening, everyone, once again. Reading the Gospel of Mark again, I am Father David Neuhaus from the Jesuit Institute in South Africa, and we are meeting today for the 11th session. As always, we will begin with a short time of prayer, then we will have a presentation of about 45 minutes, and then a time for discussion. Questions and comments can be put into the chat. And thanks again to Ursula, who is here with me, who will manage the chat. Today is, in fact, a special day. I realize, speaking to my brothers this morning, that not everybody is aware that the 9th of May is the feast of the prophet Isaiah. And as you all know by now, Mark is a real disciple of the prophet Isaiah. So our time of prayer will be evoking that feast today. So let's take a few moments with this song. So here we are again, Mark and his book of the gospel, a carefully composed first century Greek language text inspired by the scriptures of Israel in a particular way, of course, by Isaiah, whose feast we celebrate today, based upon the life of Jesus of Nazareth, following the writings of Paul of Tarsus, the first of the books of the gospel and a source for the other books. And here we see again where we are positioned in our reading and study. We are at the beginning of the opposition to Jesus. We have been doing an overview of the five episodes preceded by an introduction in which Mark describes the opposition to Jesus, which we know will reach a crescendo in the cross. So, again, here we are. The introduction, the curing of the leper, we did that a few weeks ago. And now we are looking at these five episodes of opposition in Galilee. We did number one and number five. Ah, last week, the paralytic carried by his friends and the man with the withered hand. Today, I want to move to the center. The question of fasting. We will divide this text into two parts. We'll deal with the narrative episode, and then we will spend some time on the very center of this section, which treats the relationship 
between the new and the old. This is the real subject of the opposition. So let's begin with our narrative text for tonight. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. Again, the subject here is fasting. I have put there a little note for those who remember that in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives instructions for fasting. But here, in Jesus' presence, while he is with the disciples, he says, they cannot fast those who are with him whom they recognize as the bridegroom. So let's look a little at the text in its details. First of all, I'd like to point out, next week we will study the sections two and four, and section two, which precedes this one, takes place during a dinner at Levi's house, the tax collector who Jesus called to follow him and then goes to his house for a dinner. So we have this alternation between a feast in Levi's house and then this question about fasting. Why do your disciples not fast? So what is fasting in the Old Testament? Let's look through some texts in the Old Testament that talk about fasting. We do remember, of course, and I will not present that text, that there is a day when the people of Israel fast, the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. In fact, in the text, the biblical text in the Pentateuch, it doesn't talk about fasting. But for those who are interested, you can go and look there at Leviticus 16. But in other places in the Old Testament, we do have fasting. I'm sure you all remember the wonderful story of Jonah, a story that we read during Lent. So I'll read it, and here you'll see the connection to fasting. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger, so that we do not perish. Fasting here, of course, connected to an act of radical repentance. Everyone in the city of Nineveh, a huge city, is sitting in sackcloth and fasting to beg God to forgive them their sins. A similar text can be found, you see there in the note, in the prophet Joel, a fasting of repentance. But the prophets present another kind of fasting. Here we can read again on this feast of Isaiah, a text from the book of Isaiah. Why do we fast, but do you not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? The answer, look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? 
to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Yes, this is a fast that is intimately connected with justice, not just a formality. For indeed, in the Old Testament, there is an unjust fasting. And here we can read a episode in 1 Kings 21. You'll all remember the story of, <clears throat> of Nabot, Nabot who refused to sell his vineyard to the king. And so he will die. A plot is plotted by the evil queen, Queen Jezebel. That's her portrait there. She, Jezebel, wrote in the letters to the people of the town of Nabot, Proclaim a fast and seat Nabot at the head of the assembly. Seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them bring a charge against him, saying, you have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. The men of his city, the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them, just as it was written in the letters that she had sent them. They proclaimed a fast and seated Nabot at the head of the assembly. Of course, the consequence will be the killing of innocent Nabot, so that the evil king can inherit his vineyard. And finally, again, drawing from the Old Testament with the understanding that Mark knows well the scriptures of Israel, that Mark is drawing on these scriptures and expects his reader to do likewise or his listener. And this is eschatological fasting and fasting turning to feasting in the end of time. For in the book of Zechariah, chapter 8, it is written, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts shall be called the holy mountain. The word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be seasons of joy and gladness, and cheerful festivals for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. If anyone is asking what are those fasts, they are fasts probably connected to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Now, there is another image used by Jesus in his talking to those who question why the disciples do not fast. He says, as long as the bridegroom is with the, the people, they cannot fast, for it is, in fact, a wedding feast. And here, once again, we turn to Isaiah to understand the background of this image of the bridegroom. Again, an eschatological image in the book of Isaiah, chapter 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married. For the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Again, with these texts, 
the texts on fasting, especially the last one where fasting is turned to an eschatological feasting. And this one before us in Isaiah 62, the bridegroom rejoicing over the bride, are all, of course, intended not only to allow us to understand who Jesus is in this eschatological perspective, but, of course, are also trying to engage those who do not want to recognize him. And finally, Jesus says, but a time of fasting will come when the bridegroom is taken up, removed. And I suggest here that Jesus is making an allusion to a series of texts in the book of Ezekiel that describe the taking up of the presence of God from the temple. There is a slow migration of God's presence from the Holy of Holies to the gate of the temple, to the Mount of Olives, as the presence of God, this is before the Babylonians destroy the temple in Jerusalem, the presence of God goes before the people into exile. And which way are we moving from the Holy of Holies to the gate of the temple to the Mount of Olives? We are going eastwards towards Babylon. And in Ezekiel, Exactly the same term is used when it talks about the presence of God, the glory of God. As it's written in Ezekiel chapter 10, then the glory of the Lord rose up in Hebrew or in Greek, was taken away. Exactly the same verb that is used by Mark in Jesus' words. Then the glory of the Lord was taken away from the cherub to the threshold of the house the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of the Lord. Again, the glory of the Lord is migrating and will depart towards exile. So, if we now go forward, we want to read the second part of tonight's text. And this will take up our time now of discussion in what is the center of the opposition to Jesus, the relationship between the old and the new. Again, you will remember that this text is, in a rather perhaps clumsy way, inserted into the five episodes of opposition, forming, with the text we just read on fasting, the center, the third episode. And let's now focus on this text, which is a difficult text to understand, Let's try at least trying to understand it from the point of view of the terms, the words that are used. So Jesus says, and it's a kind of parable, the first one uh, that we're coming across here in the Gospel of Mark. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Now, I'm not going to focus on the work of a tailor or the work of a winemaker, because I understand absolutely nothing about these professions, I do want to focus on the relationship between the new and the old, and what Jesus is describing here. And I will focus on the word tear. It is a word that we know, that we have already encountered. So let's look again at the presence of this word in the Gospel of Mark. Right in the beginning, when Jesus was being baptized, we confronted that word, a rather violent word, where it was written, and just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from the heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. 
That word on, in Greek, schizo. Yes, we know the word from the word schism or schizophrenia is a very powerful word in the Gospel of Mark in its verbal form used only here in the description of the baptism and one more time in chapter 15. Let's read also that text and we'll see there are the common elements that again I, I am suggesting do something for our understanding of the newness that is coming in the Son, in Jesus, the beloved. For in Mark 15, it is written in verse 38 and 39, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. Let's notice some things about these two verses that will help us understand the newness that is breaking in, in Jesus, who is the Son. First of all, of course, the proclamation of sonship, the voice from heaven, you are my son. The voice of the centurion, an enormous surprise, the centurion, of course, a Gentile, not a Jew, and a member of the team who is crucifying Jesus, this centurion is absolutely amazed at seeing Jesus hanging on the cross and proclaims his sonship. Let's notice something else that is happening in these two texts. A border is being transgressed, is being burst open. In the first text of the baptism, it's the border that separates heaven and earth. Yes, heaven in the ancient cosmology, would be the place where God sits and earth, the place where humanity lives. That border is being torn apart. And in fact, what is happening is that the heavens are being united with the earth as the sun on earth brings us into a complete communion with the life in heaven. And also in Mark 15, the tearing that happens at the time of Jesus' death on the cross, the tearing of the temple, unites two completely separate domains by the tear in the curtain, the curtain that separates between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the world. As in Jesus' death on the cross, all is made holy. Again, these two verbs, sorry, this, this single verb, appears only twice in the gospel, once at the beginning and once at the end. And in Mark, the text that we just read, it is being used to describe what happens when the new is introduced onto the old, into the old, uh, uh, in the midst of the old. There is a tear. Something violent is happening. A violence that we are sensing in the opposition to Jesus. The old, that which is already there, is having a very hard time entering into a dialogue with the new that is bursting onto the scene. Something violent is being provoked. Remember last week, the violence at the end of the five episodes of the opposition. They go out to destroy him. Again, let us remember that this is not simply a confrontation between the old of the Old Testament or the old of Israel and the newness that comes with Jesus. This is something anthropological, something profoundly spiritual. We know in our own being how difficult it is to accept the, the new. The old seems better. And Mark here is focusing on this terrible confrontation between the old and the new. Now, this theme is absolutely central to us as Christians, the old and the new. And too many of those who follow Jesus, those who tried to live his message, thought that the old 
must now be discarded. That's what it seems like here in this text from Mark. Ah, the old is finished, we want to go with the new. But what is interesting is that this very parable that Mark is quoting from the mouth of Jesus is going to be reported differently by Mark, then by Matthew, and then by Luke. And I think if we look at this same text in its three versions side by side, we will recognize the complexity of the relationship to old and to new that is being presented in the New Testament. Let's do that for a moment, looking again at Mark, alongside Mark Matthew, and then finally Luke in three columns. We call this, of course, a synopsis. Much of what Mark is writing can be seen in its synoptical relationship with Matthew and Luke. Synopsis, of course, means in Greek, a, a vision with. So we are writing in columns uh, where the accounts match and we are able to compare them. So first, let's hear again Mark 2. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. Again, two parables. The repetition that draws these two parables together is the relationship between the new and the old. Matthew in chapter 9 repeats the parable almost verbatim. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins. Until there, we have very much the same as what Mark wrote. But then Matthew adds something, and we are not studying at the moment Matthew. Hopefully we will one day. But it is typical of Matthew's concern with Mark's radicality. And so he adds, and again, remember, in the mouth of Jesus, these are the words that Jesus is speaking in the Gospel of Matthew. And so both are preserved. Yes, indeed, Matthew reminds us that whatever we make of Mark's radicality, we cannot understand the new without the old. And that is not just a one-time thing. Once we've understood the new, we discard the old, but rather the old constantly sheds light on the new. And so, yes, the church in her wisdom united together the old and the new in our Bible, the Old Testament and the new. The old never to be discarded, but both are preserved. Both are profound sources of getting to know the one we seek to follow, Jesus. So Matthew, and again, perhaps I can even mention we will on Sundays soon begin, begin, I think we begin on the 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time, reading Matthew's long discourse on the parables parallel to Mark chapter 4. It's uh, Matthew chapter 13. And it will end by describing the scribe that is fit for the kingdom of heaven, who brings out of his treasure the old and the new together. For it is only in the interrelationship between the old and the new that we can get a grip on the one who comes into the old, renewing it all. And so both are preserved. And then Luke, again, takes up the same two parables in chapter 5, but he does what he needs to do with the parable, reporting, of course, what Jesus is saying in the following way. No one tears a piece from a new garment and sews it on an old garment. Otherwise, the new will be torn and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled. 
and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. Until there, more or less, we have the same two parables. And then Jesus adds in the Gospel of Luke, and no one after drinking old wine desires new wine, but says the old is good. Sounds almost like Luke might be from France. Ah, winemaking. The old is good. And Luke, of course, is describing something foundational to Luke's own work, where in his tripartite story, we have the Old Testament as the good that is the basis for the gospel that he writes, the gospel of Luke, and the story that then continues in the third part of this history of salvation, the story of the church, where indeed the church is described with the same description as the people of Israel. And we have much to learn from the story of the people of Israel in order to advance on our way. So again, we see the complexity, and I'm going to introduce a fourth text, a fourth text that is often misunderstood by many who read the New Testament, but it is also foundational in understanding the relationship between old and new. I'm turning now to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the center of the argument in the Epistle to the Hebrews. We're just going to read the text. I'm not going to be able to explain the whole theology, this incredible, uh, rich and deep theology of the writer of the Epistles to the Hebrews. Let's just focus on this text. God finds fault with them when he says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and growing old will soon disappear. Now, I'm sure most of you realize that where the quotation marks begin in the middle of chapter 8, the days are surely coming sorry, verse 8, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, all the way down to the end of verse 12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more, is an Old Testament text. It is taken from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31. Indeed, it is Jeremiah who speaks about a new covenant, a new, in our Latin interpretation, we say, a new testament, a new testament, a new covenant. But what we must ask is, what is here the relationship between the new covenant that God is making and the old one? Well, very important to notice that the new covenant is different from whatever went before, not because of content, not because of meaning, but rather because the new is now written on their hearts. What was the problem with what went before the new? It was given and it was written on, we can say stone, on parchment, in books. It was exterior to the people who are called into the covenant. But this new covenant is written on the heart. For that reason, there is no reason to teach it anymore. 
For all know the Lord, from the least to the greatest. For the new covenant is inscribed not on some external material, but on the heart of each person. Now we can understand perhaps the end. In speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, not obsolete in its content, not obsolete in its matter, but it has become obsolete because now whatever it was, that covenant is now written on the heart. It needs no more to be taught, no more to be repeated, for it defines the very existence of who we are. Now, please notice the last words. And what is obsolete and growing old? Now, why is it obsolete and growing old? Because we no longer need that external source. It's written on our hearts. But notice this is the eschatological horizon of the text. And what is obsolete and growing old? It's not old yet. It's growing old because we are not yet in the image and likeness of the new, who is only Jesus. Only Jesus has that covenant written on his heart. He is without sin. We are not. And so what is obsolete and growing old as we conform more and more to the image of Jesus will soon disappear at some future moment when we are in his image and likeness, when we no longer need the law, the covenant, as exterior moments in our lives, but rather, as they do for Jesus, they define exactly who we are. Now, at the end of this discussion of the relationship between new and old, I want to go back to a text that I introduced earlier on. And it is, I think, a rather revolutionary text that was published in 2005 by Pope Benedict shortly after he became Pope. And he wrote to us, the people of God, an encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is love. And I want to read a section a little longer than what we heard last time. And remember again, what we're trying to understand is the opposition to Jesus, the difficulty to accept the new, into our lives, and what is that newness? So, the newness of Christ, from Benedict XVI, Deus Caritas Est, 2005. And here is what Benedict says, and I think it is a little bit of a shock to many Christians who seem to think that love is new, charity is new, mercy is new, this is all new. No, Benedict says, what is new is Jesus and nothing else. For he writes, the real novelty of the New Testament lies not so much in new ideas as in the figure of Christ himself, who gives flesh and blood to those concepts, an unprecedented realism. What does that mean? Yes, in the New Testament, we don't have newness except the fact that Jesus incarnates all of that which is the Old Testament, all that teaching of God, which has at its very center love. Please remember again, in the Old Testament, yes, God came to give us a teaching, a Torah in the Old Testament of love. But where is the newness? that Jesus turns this into flesh and blood, an unprecedented realism. These are not any more external teachings, but the life of our brother Jesus, who bursts into our midst. I continue reading. In the Old Testament, the novelty of the Bible did not consist merely in abstract notions, but in God's unpredictable and in some sense unprecedented activity. God is love among us, but we don't respond as perfectly as God would like. And then in the center of this text, this divine activity 
this divine activity of God's love now takes on dramatic form when in Jesus Christ, it is God himself who goes in search of the stray sheep a suffering and lost humanity. Again, I'd like to propose that Jesus in these episodes of opposition is coming in the midst of his people to provoke them to enter into a deep relationship with him. His failure will be salvific because it will lead to the cross. But for now, it is painful that we are unable to accept this newness bursting into our lives. The text continues of Benedict. When Jesus speaks in his parables of the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep, of the woman who looks for the lost coin, of the father who goes to meet and embrace his prodigal son, these are no mere words. They constitute an explanation of his very being and activity. And then, again, we won't reach there this time around, but we have it already on the horizon, the cross. His death on the cross is the culmination of that turning of God against himself. For indeed, it is he who dies on the cross. He gives himself for us. That turning of God against himself, in which he gives himself in order to raise humanity up and save them. This is love in its most radical form. So I'm suggesting, brothers and sisters, that these episodes of opposition, and we'll continue next week with episode number two and episode number four, but here we are at the very center, is this confrontation with the newness of love incarnate coming into our midst and our inability to receive him to receive that love in the form of Jesus. So I think that that's enough for tonight. I will end the slideshow and we can take a time for discussion. I hope that I've provoked you to comment, ask questions so that we can together go more deeply into what we're studying. Okay, I think that we're all here now. And so I invite you to write into the chat. Please remember that if you don't, then Ursula will have to come up with all the questions and comments by herself. Looks like they're putting me on the spot today. <laughs> well, take up the challenge. I um, was quite intrigued by this idea of old and new and it's part of the old is actually part of the new and in a sense that's an image of our lives that there's the old us which grows and becomes the new us and then that we have an old relationship with Christ which becomes a new relationship and so that whole journey from old to new is is really part of our everyday existence yes Although I think that what we need to add to that description, perhaps, or at least focus on it, is the violence, the tearing uh, that Mark really wants to bring out. In other words, indeed, the new cannot be understood without the old, but it cannot be understood uniquely within the context of the old. That tearing, that violence, uh, the old is there to prepare, that's its purpose to lead us to the new. But when the new comes, and again, I'm reminded of Luke's wonderful uh, comment, we prefer the old. We know it, it tastes yes. better. Yeah. It's yeah. very difficult to open ourselves to newness. And I think that this is the radicality of Mark. He really wants to focus on that because we are going towards the cross. And again, remember that even from a simply word point of view, Cross is a newness that one doesn't find in the old. There's no cross. But what is so startling is that everything else we find in the old. So again, it's that tearing, that violence by which the new is introduced into our midst, 
that is so difficult to, to accommodate, to welcome, because we are so settled, we are so comfortable. I, in our new uh, lingo, we say, Jesus comes to lead us out of our zones of comf comfort. Well, that's putting it very mildly uh, as he throws us into uh, a brave new world where we must really walk behind him in order to know the way. But in order to move forward in any part of your life, there is a wrenching away from the old. Sometimes it's easy to do, but other times it's really, really uncomfortable because we're afraid yes. to get let go. Um, yes, yeah, Chris, thank you. Again, and what's so fascinating as we compare the texts is the different approaches to that, uh, that it all gets taken up into the New Testament. This idea that the New Testament is singular in its voice uh, it really needs to be put aside as we embrace this pluralism, uh, this understanding of how many levels of meaning and how many different meanings there are in the words that we are hearing. So thank you, Ursula. Thank you. Um, Don asks, who were the disciples of the Pharisees? Okay, so the disciples of the Pharisees, remember that uh, many of the introductions to the New Testament try to describe the society of Jesus and break up the Jewish teachers into different schools. So I think that from a simply uh, formal point of view, the disciples of the Pharisees are those who follow the Pharisees, as opposed to the disciples, for example, of the Sadducees. So again, what is being presented, but remember everything written from the perspective of describing Jesus. Jesus has disciples, so those who oppose him in the text, again, we're dealing with textual Pharisees, textual Sadducees, they too would have their disciples. Remember in the text too, we're talking about the disciples of John, uh, not just the disciples of the Pharisees, but the disciples of John as well. Uh, again, everyone being written in the image and likeness of Jesus, who has the disciples that we have already encountered. Uh, Don then comments, could the old also mean our prejudices, fears, and old habits, which we need to empty out before we can fill up with a fresh new way? Yes. I mean, those are included in the whole fabric of the old. Okay, using again fabric because we were talking about fabrics. Uh, the whole fabric of the old is everything that makes us who we are. I think now when we think of prejudices and ideas and conceptions and ways of living in the world, the radicality that is already in the Old Testament when, for example, Abraham is told to go, go, go. Uh, that insistence of God to leave everything. And how is it defined in that text? What is the everything of the old? To walk out with God into the unknown? Well, your country, your tribe, your father's house, meaning everything that goes with that. And to go where? To a land that I will show you. One word in Hebrew. I will show you one word. Four letters that define everything. The I and the you, we now walk out. Ah, you following my lead. It's not a land where you're given a map. Maps belong to the old. It's not a land that has a name. Names belong to the old. This is a land that is defined by this relationship with God who steps into the life of Abraham. So again, there I think we have this idea of radical transformation, a radical transformation. Um, Debbie and Terence ask, uh, you may have already answered this, but what is the symbolism of the tearing of the curtain in the temple? So, the, uh, again, for this, we'd need to go back to Leviticus uh, uh, and even more specifically, the last uh, chapters of Exodus to see how the tent, that is, of course, a model for the temple, is uh, described and how it became very, very important to set aside a space uh, that we call the Holy of Holies, where no one went in except the high priest, 
uh, using language that's not yet in the book of Leviticus, but the high priest on the day of the atonement, because there is the dwelling place of God. So the tearing of the curtain that separates that incredibly holy inner sanctum from the rest of existence means that now what is happening, everything has become the place where God resides. Uh, as it's described in the book of Revelation, God now dwells in the midst of the people with no separation. And I think that that is what Mark uh, is pointing to by describing in chapter 15 the tearing of the curtain by the way it parallels the tearing of the heavens because the heavens separate between the earth and the dwelling place of God in the sky. So the tearing again means that something radical has been transformed in how we live with God. Charles asks, um, in what sense does God turn on himself? Okay, very important question. And I would strongly suggest, Charles, that you take up um, Deus Caritas Est and you read those paragraphs. If I'm not mistaken, it's from paragraph 8 to paragraph 11. The text there that is being evoked is, in fact, Hosea chapter 11, because what happens in Hosea chapter 11 is that God, in God's pain at being betrayed by God's beloved people, just as Hosea himself was betrayed by his prostitute wife, God says, will I treat my beloved people like Sodom and Gomorrah? Now, what did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah? In biblical terms, God took Sodom and Gomorrah and overturned them. I turned them upside down, the total destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I need to say in the text, it doesn't say Sodom and Gomorrah. It gives the names of two of the other cities that were overturned. There were in fact five cities, the major ones being Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, so God, what did God do to Sodom and Gomorrah or the five cities near the Dead Sea? Overturned them. Shall I do that to my beloved? And God says, no. What I will do is I will overturn my heart. And Benedict writes there, this is a, already a faint reference to the cross. What does it mean that God will overturn God's heart? God, instead of wreaking vengeance on God's own people, will destroy God's own heart because of his love for his people. And of course, our Benedict is suggesting that this is what the cross is. God's offering of Jesus are for our sin is God turning on himself. So again, that takes on a much more full meaning when you read that encyclical, particularly in those paragraphs near the beginning. Um, Terence goes back to the curtain and he says, if the tearing brings earth and heaven together, why do so many Christians focus so much on heaven as something or some place separate from here and now? So I would like to turn that question into a statement by itself. Indeed, why? <laughs> Indeed, why? Uh, I think that we are called to live heaven on earth. Uh, and that's so profound in the book of Revelations that we're reading now in the, in the readings from the breviary, uh, where in the end, uh, heavenly Jerusalem comes down on earth as the city where God and humanity live together. So Terence, I take that question not as a question, but as a challenge. Why indeed? Mm -hmm. um, Lillian says, the Pharisees who followed Jesus secretly, such as Nicodemus, um, is this because they got the new and old concept? <laughs> so first of all, Lillian, a little nudge. You're making goulash, you're cooking a stew. Okay, no Nicodemus <laughs> in Mark. <laughs> Nicodemus certainly could represent that in the Gospel of John. Okay, <laughs> Nicodemus is a very important 
uh, uh, personality in the Gospel of John, by the way, again, beautifully represented in The Chosen, uh, the, the television series, um, and also very helpful in shattering uh, the idea that some might still have of this is something of Jews against Christians. No, no, no. Uh, Jesus breaks into our human uh, reality and provokes us to leave behind the old. So indeed, yes, if you want to apply that to Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, Nicodemus is someone who enters into deep dialogue with Jesus, not like the five episodes that we have in the Gospel of Mark. Rebecca says, um, thanks for sharing the different types of fasting. Which fasting then were the disciples accused of not taking part in, um, in comparison to John's and the Pharisees' disciples? So that's an interesting question, and um, I'm not sure that there's a very, very clear answer. I presented fasts of repentance. Remember that Jesus is coming after John, and John has been calling for repentance to prepare to receive Jesus. So here, partially, it could be that those that have already recognized Jesus have fasted and are now with the bridegroom. But remember that there will be a fasting of repentance or a fasting of mourning that comes when Jesus is removed, when Jesus is taken away. Ah, we saw that in the text. It's not just the moment of the bridegroom, but Jesus also points to the moment when the bridegroom will not be there. And then, of course, uh, there will be the need to prepare, prepare with fasting and prayer for Jesus' coming, uh, coming again. Um, Don asks, is there a logical link between the bridegroom metaphor and the old material or wineskins, as Mark puts these two together. Interesting. I've never thought of that before, but suddenly it strikes me uh, that, yes, for the bridegroom, uh, for the wedding, there would need to be the garment and the wine to celebrate. Perhaps there is, on some level, a connection. At the same time, I'd like to point again to the fact that in a kind of literary breakdown of the text, these two parables are kind of in themselves a tear in the text. Uh, they are breaking through the narrative text. And let's remember what parables are for. Uh, we will deal with that one day when we reach chapter four, or hopefully uh, we'll be dealing with that when we read this year, the Gospel of Matthew, weeks 15, 16, and 17, that parables are told to wake us up. They are to shake us awake. Uh, the best example of that kind of parable, which I think really exemplifies what a parable is, is the story of David, uh, who has just taken Bathsheba, killed her husband, lied, murdered, been adulterous, and Nathan comes to tell him a parable because David is deep in his sin, unconscious, unconscious, of being not in communion with God. So Nathan comes in and tells a parable. That parable breaks into the life of David at that particular moment. And it's what makes David great. He can hear the parable. He can engage with it. And after hearing the parable of what the rich man did to the poor man, David says, he must die. Of course, it's only at that moment that he realizes he's pronounced a death sentence on himself. So again, that parable breaks into his life. And I think here the parables break into the text and they are supposed to break into our lives to bring us into discipleship with Jesus. Uh, Don asks another question. Um, is there a fasting period amongst Jews and in what form is this and when? So if we talk about Jews today, indeed, okay, indeed, there are days of fasting, okay, days of fasting that are prescribed. The two most important are the Day of Atonement 
and the day that commemorates the destruction of the two temples called the ninth of Av. But there are other days of fasting, which are half days that are spread over the whole calendar, many of them relating to the events that led to the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. So yes, Jews today fast. We fast on Lent. And of course, uh, a whole month of fasting also for Muslims. Fasting seems to be an integral part of our spiritual life. That seems a good place to end. because Excellent, no because I think we've, reached, we've so. reached the time. So, dear friends, next week will be our last time together, at least for now. Um, next week after the class, you will receive a evaluation page. You can give me the mark that I deserve, but much more important than distributing marks, it will be the time also to express whether we should continue this at some moment in the future and in what format should we do that. So again, it's been a great joy to be with you. Thank you for being here. And we will meet again next week for our last session when we end off our discussion of this, these episodes of opposition. So have a wonderful evening. Good night. <laughs>